on Sunday nights, we are in a study of the books of the kings, and I have taken a little, I veered off for a couple, three or four weeks to go through the number seven. To go through the number seven. And seven is a very significant number. We've been, what I'm doing is I'm teaching about Israel. Israel is on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea and all the nations around Israel, when, you, when you're reading the Bible, uh, explaining Old Testament, there's a timeline to the Old Testament. You start, with, you start with Adam, then you go down through his lineage. In that Genesis, the fifth chapter, this is the lineage of Adam. It goes down to Noah. Noah, of course, Noah is in Adam's lineage. Everybody's in Adam's lineage, but this is a particular lineage. Then Shem... Then about 280 years from Shem is Abraham. Abraham would be the great, 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 whatever, grandson of Shem. Abraham, then Isaac, the son of Abraham, and then Jacob, the son of, of uh, Isaac, and then Jacob has uh, his son Joseph. That's the four patriarchs right there. And uh, jo Jacob's name is changed to Israel, and that's what the Bible is about. It's about Israel, and then they're in, then they come back, they are given the land. The land is given to Abraham, the land of Israel in the eastern end of the Mediterranean, and then, and then they are carried through Joseph, being sold into bondage in Egypt. They're there for 400 years, then 40 years in the wilderness, and then they're under judges, judges for about... Uh, 280 years, something like that, 280 years. And then after Judges, you've got the books of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel through, uh, second, through second Chronicles. That's the book of the Kings. And everything in the Bible is about that right there. It's about that. It's about the promise unto the woman, to Eve, in Genesis 3.15... I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And that's talking about the seed of the woman would be Cain, not Abel, Cain. And the seed of Christ will be Abel. And Abel is the promised seed. And there'll be enmity between these sons. And as you get on down here, there'll be enmity uh, between the sons, between Jacob and Esau. And there'll be enmity between Isaac and Ishmael. And we know that these men uh, wrestled, and Jacob and Esau actually wrestled in the womb. And when you're studying the Bible, it's about pointing towards Israel becoming a nation, a land that's promised to Abraham, and then all the prophets, 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 if I may put it up here this way, prophets, prophets, prophets. Now, what I'm doing, I am surrounding on the board the time period that Israel was a nation with the prophets because all the prophets, when you get into Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, you get into uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, uh, Haggai, Zephaniah, Hag uh, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. You get into all these prophets. Every one of them are prophesying around Israel. Their concern is Israel, and all of them in every, every one of the prophets in the Bible is either, either prophesying concerning Jerusalem, who went after idol gods, who went after Baal in the grove, or Shemosh, or Molech, which are terms for the sun, or they're prophesying against northern Israel for having brought Baal in the grove into Israel, or they're prophesying against southern Judah for going after Baal in the grove, or they're prophesying against the land of Ammon for bringing uh, the sun got into Israel, which their form of Baal or Hercules, the Ammonites, which is northern Jordan, their form of, uh, of the sun god was Molech, 
They brought that in Israel. So God prophesies against Ammon. You'll find that starting in about the 44th chapter of Jeremiah. He prophesies against Moab and uses the prophets to do this because uh, Moab brings Shemosh, which is another term for the sun god into Israel. He prophesies against the Philistines. In fact, if you go over in the, about the 44th chapter of Jeremiah, Jeremiah will say, against the Philistines, against Ammon, against Moab, against uh, Tyre, uh, concerning Egypt, uh, against and all of these people that have polluted Israel, either the nations, each one of the prophets, Hosea is prophesying against northern Israel and southern Judah. Jeremiah is prophesying, prophesying against everybody for what they've done by polluting Israel. Uh, Isaiah is prophesying against Israel and Judah. Uh, Hosea is prophesying against northern Israel, which is Ephraim and Judah. Uh, Zephaniah is prophesying against uh, southern Judah and the Philistines by naming the cities of Ashdod and Ashkelon. So all the prophets are prophesying either against one of the nations that have polluted Israel or there's three things major they're prophesying. All these prophets, and you can look as you, as you go into it, they're either prophesying in for, some form against Israel, either either Israel or Judah or a Jerusalem, and mainly Jerusalem because Jerusalem is where the temple sits and that's where the law is to emanate from. So this is one of the things that all the prophets, it don't matter who it is in the Old Testament, and number two, they're prophesying against the nations, nations that surround, surround Israel and Judah, uh, particularly Ammon, Moab, Phil Philistines, uh, Egypt. This is everybody that's polluted Israel. Tyre, Syria, and so forth. Anyone that's done anything to cause Israel to go after their gods, Ammon, of course, being Molech and Moab being Shemosh and Philistines being Dagon and so forth. Of course, we know what Tyre brought in. They brought Baal in, Baal and Remen in Syria and Ra or various other gods or Osiris or Isis, or the female deities, the female counterparts of these. And then the third thing the prophets were prophesying against, and, and you can leave, once you get into Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and once you move from there into Isaiah, Jeremiah, like I just got through giving to you, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, and so forth, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zephaniah, uh, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That's the Old Testament prophets right there. Other than those are the ones who wrote books. Every one of them are prophesying either against Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem or the nations that polluted them with sun worship or they're prophesying against. What's the other thing they'd be prophesying against? Can you take a while yet? Well, no. We're talking about a system. They're all prophesying against a system of some kind. Uh, the empires. Empires. This is everything the prophets is about right here. Everything. That's not hard, is it? Babylon. No, an empire is Babylon. Persia. Greece. Rome. Now, if you can understand this right here, this, make, this is going to make it easy for you. When you go to read Jeremiah, Isaiah, any of the prophets, Hosea, Joel, Habakkuk, uh, Haggai, any of these, they're prophesying concerning this. Now, some of them had a particular job like Haggai and Zechariah. That was in 520. Their job was to tell Israel to get busy building the temple of God. You sat down 16 years ago, stand up, you got houses dwelling, it's time for you to get busy. And of course they did. 
So all of it was either concerning about rebuilding the temple for having been destroyed, for having gone after the Baal and the Grove. Everything that it was about was about either the Baal and the Grove worship or forsaking the laws of God's Sabbath and going after other gods. And the gods that were brought in were brought in by the other nations. That's everything the prophets is about. Once you learn the 500-year period about, about Israel being a nation, once you learn the judges, which is Gideon and Samson, and that's Israel being ruled by these individuals, and then once you understand the 400 years, the 40 years in the wilderness, that's the book of Numbers, the 400 years in Egypt, and then once you understand the book of Genesis and the patriarchs, you got a basic understanding. What I've done is just give you a real basic outline of the Old Testament right here. That's what it's about. It's not really hard. Learn the stories, learn the people and the events, and you'll be able to see all of this. I don't think I've ever quite put it up here this way. I've said that, but I've never just put it up on the board that way. And uh, that's what it's all about. It's really, is that hard to understand? It's not hard to understand at all. And most people that come here say, we don't know why God was mad at Israel. Why was God uh, in a rage? And why, what did they do? Uh, what were the prophets all about? Gosh, that confuses me. It shouldn't confuse you, usually. You, well, let me just show you one more time what I, after I said it. Let me go ahead and do, go over to Jeremiah. All I'm going to do is show you the beginning of these chapters. Jeremiah preached against everybody because he, mainly because he was the last prophet to stand in the streets of Jerusalem right before their demise, right before Nebuchadnezzar leveled them to the ground. Now, look here, like over in... Let's look here in uh, uh, 40, okay. Yeah, in Jeremiah, let's just look at this. I just want to show you how to understand this. Uh, Jeremiah 40, uh, 40, 46, just look at 46. 46 in the first verse. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Gentiles, against Egypt, against... That's what this, that's what this whole chapter is about here. Then when you go into uh, verse, uh, chapter 47, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines because Israel worshiped Dagon. And look over here in 48 and 1, against Moab. That chapter is going to be talking about God is against Moab. When you go into... The Old Testament is not hard like people would have you believe. It's not hard at all. You have to stop and look at it and see what's going on. And look over here in 49 and 1. Concerning the Ammonites. That's northern Jordan up here. See, there's Ammon Jordan. Anytime you see the land of Ammon, that's it right there. Right, just northern Jordan. Amman, Jordan is the capital city. And look over here. Uh, look over here in... Uh, look at four, 50 in verse 1. The word that the Lord spake against Babylon. Is that hard? It's not hard at all. All you're going to do is read through that chapter, and he's going to tell you all about Babylon and how he's going to destroy him. And he's... And he speaks through 50 and 51 about Babylon. Look at 51 verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon. He's talking about judgment that's going to come against him. You see what I'm saying? And that's not hard. I always read the first chapter of a prophet, usually somewhere in that first chapter. Sometimes it, very few times it'll not be so. But usually they'll tell you who they're going to preach against in the first chapter and why they're preaching against them. And if, you, if you've got any of these encyclopedias, pick them up, look over there at uh, Zephaniah, and he'll, it'll tell you who he's going to preach against and why he's going to preach against them because they polluted Israel. That's, this is basically the whole story of the Old Testament. Do you realize that? It's, not, it's just about one family and people polluting them and God bringing judgment against everybody pollutes them. You see what I'm saying? It's not as hard as what it looks. But it would be hard if you didn't understand anything about it. Why do they call uh, Babylon a golden cup in, in the Lord's hand? Well, that's because God, uh, God always speaks of a cup. 
that he's going to make people to drink of. And they drank of it. And what's a cup? That, a cup is a severe ordeal. It's what it is. And he made Israel to drink of that cup, didn't he? Because he, he made southern Judah because he brought Babylon down. And they drank the cup of Babylon. That's what they did. Drinking of a cup meant to undergo a death. meant some severe ordeal in life. That's what it's talking about. And did not, didn't Zechariah say that, that, uh, it, that Israel will be, will be a cup of trembling in the hand of everyone that reaches out and takes hold of it? When you drink of that cup, you're drinking of the judgment of God when you come against God's people. And I'm not talking about literal Israel. I'm talking about God's believing Israel, which is us, the church. Now, we've come through all these kings, and I'm not going to review them. We've come through all these kings, and we've come down here where we've come through, it's taken us about four years to get through First and Second Samuel, First Kings, and we're in the sixth chapter or the fifth chapter of Second Kings, and we, I'm not going to go, we've already come through all these men, Saul, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaz, uh, down here to Jehoram, actually, that's where we are is Jehoram, and then we've come through Jeroboam, Nadab, Baasha, Elah, Zimri, Amri, uh, Ahab, Ahaziah and Jehoram over here, and we're, we're down here in this, right in the middle of this king's chart, and we're in the fifth chapter of 2 Kings, where that Jehoram is the son of Ahaziah, uh, the son of, Je it's, I'll get them right in a minute, Jehoram, the son of Ahab, is the king of northern Israel, and there's a man named Na Naaman, and he is the commanding general of Syria, and as a commanding general of Syria, he's probably the most powerful general in the world at that time, as far as just armies. Now, we know that they couldn't whip Israel if God, if uh, Israel had a righteous king serving God. Well, there was a man there in Israel, northern Israel. His name was Elisha, and he was the prophet of God. And Naaman, through all of his glory and all of his pomp and all of the uh, accolades that men were giving to him, uh, Naaman had... One, uh, one defect. Uh, he had leprosy. Leprosy is a type of and a picture of sin all through the scriptures. And a uh, man that had leprosy, if, he had le if you had leprosy and it was contagious leprosy, you had to stand back during the days of Jesus. He had to stand back and say, unclean, unclean, stay away from me. That was the law uh, because if, uh, if you had contagious leprosy, someone could get, catch that. Well, of course, Naaman goes to the house of Elisha, and uh, Elisha tells him to go dip seven times in the Jordan River. Now, of course, baptism or washing has to do with seven. That's what it has to do with. Uh, and we, we're talking about the number seven, and I'm going to put some things on the board here for you. I'm going to put this on the board again about the number seven. Let me erase some of this. Seven is a very interesting number. God did not have Naaman be dipped in the water seven times just because he said, hmm, let me see. Uh, uh, th think of a number. He probably told Michael, think of a number between one and ten, and we'll have him dip that many times in Jordan. I doubt seriously if that's what he did. Because seven is a specific number in Scripture, and it has, it has great meaning all the way through the Scripture. Now... Let me write this on the board for you again. I should make you copies of this. I'll do that next week. But you've got several words. You have the word, and I'm going to give you Strong's number with them, 7620. That is the word S-H-A-B-U-W-A, S-H-A-B-U-W-A. And that word is actually uh, the word weak, weak, that's the same word as the 70 weeks of Daniel. 70 weeks, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. But the word is actually not weeks. It's actually sevens. Seventy sevens. There are seven days in a week, but those were weeks of years. We know that. I'm not going into there right now. Then you have 76.21. And 76.21, uh, it is the word S H. Uh, e B U U W A H Shabua. That word means to uh, to s something sworn, sworn, 
or to swear, to swear and uh, to take an oath. And the and only people we can take, the only person in the universe we can take an oath to is unto God. Then you have this, uh, you have the next number, 7650, and this is the word Shabbat, S-H-A-B-A. And Shabbat means to complete, to complete, complete, or it means to seven one's self. If you'll notice, when you take an oath to God, that has to do with a promise. A promise is one half of a contract. You have two men make a contract or a covenant, and what was our part of the covenant? When we seven ourselves, we actually circumcise ourselves. Circumcision was our sign of the covenant, and it has become more than just circumcising the foreskin. Now it's circumcising the heart and the ear. Stephen stood before the Sanhedrin, and he said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in ear and heart. So it's the ear and the heart that are circumcised, and that's when we seven ourselves. Uh, and it means to swear is what it means. It means to swear. So seven and swearing to God. That's the only one we swear to. We swear to God. When he says, Thou shalt not swear by the temple or by anything else, I swear upon my sons and my children. He said, Don't do that because you, when you swear, you're guaranteeing something is what you're doing. You're dying or you're making a pledge, pledge that you can guarantee something. You're making a pledge. I pledge, I swear, I lay my life down for a flag. I lay my life down for this promise over here. The Lord said, you can't make one hair black or white. Don't swear to anything. S-W-E-A-R. There is an R. Huh? I don't know. Sometimes it's spelled that way. I don't know what the difference is. Swear. S-W-E-A-R. Okay. All right, now, then you have, then you have this word, 7651, 7651, this is the cardinal number, it is the word S-H-E-B-A, and we even brought out the Queen of Sheba, we brought out how that uh, she had to be sevened before Solomon, if you remember, we brought that out in, when we went through Solomon and Sheba, uh, that means, th that is the number seven, Seven. Now, if seven didn't have a greater meaning than just a seven on a board, all this wouldn't be true. There'd be no need to go into it. That is the word seven, and our seventeenth. And then you have the word Sheba. This was actually comes from the word S H I B A H, Sheba. Then you have uh, the word Sheba. You've got a little a little different in the. Uh, construction of the Greek, but let me put this up here. It's, it's spelled the same way. Oops, let me put the number of it. It is 7652. 7652. And it is the word Sheba, and it's the word seven. Seven. This is actually up here. This is an indefinite number of sevens. It could be 17. 17. And then you have the words Sheba, uh, 7655, and that is S-H-I-B-A-H. -H. That means seven times, seven times. That's how, how many times shall I forgive a man, Lord? Seven times. Peter asked Jesus, and the Lord said 70 times seven. That's the number of divine forgiveness. That's the number of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And then you have 7656. And that is the word S-H-I-B-A-H. That's a place in Palestine. That's a city. A city. Then you have Shibayim, 7657, S-H-I-B-I-Y-M. And that is 70. And if you'll notice, then you have the word Shibana, S-A, this is 7658, 
and this is S-H-I-B-A-N-A-H, -A -A and that is the word, uh, that is the masculine of 7651, that word uh, uh, Sheba, 7651, that is seven times, uh, that is, excuse me, that's seven also. And you got several other words here. The main thing I wanted you to see, to complete, if we seven ourselves and we complete, what's the New Testament word for complete? T-E-L-E-I-O-S or T-E-L-E-I-O-T-E-S. That is the word when the Bible speaks of agape, love is perfect, and that's also the word be therefore perfect, even as your father's which is in heaven is perfect. And that's also the word, uh, let us leave the, found the principles of the doctrines of faith and let us go on to perfection in Hebrews, the sixth chapter. That means to be complete. It means to be complete or mature. So when we seven ourselves, we are mature. And that's why he was, it was said that he had to be dipped in the water. Let me just give you a couple of these words. Uh, this word, uh, this word in Daniel that first word up there, 7620, that's the word in Daniel, the ninth chapter, verse 24, when the Bible speaks of seven weeks are determined, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. In 16 and 9, it's the word seven weeks. It's the word weeks or sevens is what it is. Then here's what's interesting. This word here, 7651, which comes from that word Shabuah, the word Shabuah comes from Shabuah, it, this, word, uh, this word means to swear or seven oneself. That is the word in, uh, in Genesis 24 and 8. It's the word oath. It's the word oath in 26 and 3. It's the same word, Exodus 22 and 11, an oath of the Lord. It's the word swear an oath all through here, the Lord's oath. So when we take an oath, we seven ourselves and we make a covenant with God when we become, uh, we become circumcised of the heart. And it's the, the word 7650 here, Shabbat, to complete or seven oneself. That word is the word swore or sworn or swear. All through the Old Testament scripture, it's the word swear. You do have S-W-A-R-E in some places. You got S-W-A-R in others. Uh, it's the word the Lord has sworn in truth over there in Psalms 132, 11. Uh, all through the Old Testament, it's the word swear. So the only ones we can swear to, and we can't do that on our own, it will be God that works in us to willing to do of his good pleasure. That's what it'll be. Now, it ha sevens has to do with the completeness of Scripture. We said last week, you have seven and four all through the Scripture related. Seven and four. You remember we had uh, four times, and when you find the four, it doesn't matter if it's four, forty, four hundred, or four thousand. Anytime you find four, uh, it has to do with the judgments of God. You got one, two, three, four judgments, the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. This is the four judgments that God, in fact, in the 14th chapter of Ezekiel, God calls these my four sore judgments. God would bring these three first, and then when Israel did not repent after a certain amount of time, he had sent the beast, and that was Babylon, Persia, and Greece, and Rome. And the Jews said any multiple of 10, 100, or 1,000 was a form of the original number. And I might go ahead and, and bring this out, that uh, I taught on gematria. Gematria is when the alphabet was invented, the Greek alphabet and the Hebrew alphabet. When they were created, uh, the, the men who formed the alphabet gave each one of the letters of the Greek alphabet and the Hebrew alphabet gave them a numerical value. They would start with the alpha and call it one the beta 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Then they'd start over again, 20, uh, 30, 40, or uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, uh, 70, 80, 100, and then they'd go up from there. 
Well, when they assign these letters, uh, we've done a lot of study on gematria. I decided to add up all the names from Adam to Jacob one night, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, so I took Jacob's, Jacob's righteous name, and I took Abraham's righteous name. Abraham's, Abraham, Abram was an unrighteous name. Abram means high father or proud father. Abraham means father of many nations. So I took Abraham and I took Israel instead of Jacob and added those, all those names up in the Old Testament and it covered the entire board. And I wanted to make sure I was getting exactly right. And I added up about four or five times myself. And then since my, Mike teaches math, I said, Mike, check my figures on this and see if all these add up. And they added up to exactly 7,000. And we know that any multiple of those of uh, 10, 100,000 is a form of the original number. So this is a picture of a type what God said to Elijah, I've got 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Well, I've said this to you through the years that seven is the number of divine refinement all through the scriptures. Twelve is the number of the complete church and seven is the number of of the refined church. And you're going to find that. You see 144,000, which is 12 times 12,000, and you see 12,000 out of each tribe in the seventh chapter of Revelation, but that's an improper numbering for literal Israel because uh, Levi is numbered, Levi is named there, and Levi was never numbered with Israel, and Dan was left out, <laughs> so that's not a proper numbering for literal Israel. The 144,000 is the church. The Bible says that the 144,000 is the first fruits. Well, the scripture says in James 1:18, of his own will begat he us that we may be a kind of first fruits. That's what we are. And the first fruits was the firstborn of the body. And the firstborn originally was supposed to be the priesthood, but God said in Numbers, the eighth chapter, I want to substitute the Levites for the firstborn. I bought the firstborn when you came out of Egypt with the blood on the doorpost, that belongs to me. I want you to redeem them. So he said, I own them, they're mine. Death rightfully belongs to them. And so, of course, death rightfully belongs to the first birth, only the second birth is going to be born again. Now, seven, I'm trying to show you how seven is the number of refinement and how seven and four, you've got them going together. You had uh, four times the Lord said, Four times, he said, I'll punish you seven times for your sin. He tells Israel that four times, and each time he names sword, famine, pestilence, and beast. Says that in the 26th chapter of Leviticus. And we know that God, Moses, uh, I'll get it right in a minute, Moses, Noah, I mean. And Noah went to the ark, and he waited seven days before, he waited seven days before God caused it to rain for 40 days. And then we talked about in Mark, the 8th chapter, how God fed 7,000, he fed 4,000, I'll get it, 4,000 with seven loaves of bread. So you got seven and four there. You got seven and four all through the scriptures, and I'll be hitting some more of those. Now, what we're doing, I'm back over here. It's real hot up here. I am burning up. I told you I was going to go back to Revelation, the first chapter, to get into the sevens with you. Let's go back to Revelation, the first chapter. We went through a bunch of sevens last week. And to see the refined church, well, I, you remember when he fed, he fed, the, he fed 5,000 5, with five loaves, five loaves and two fishes, two fish, and what he took up was 12 baskets full so that none would be lost. Well, that's the number of the total church, but I keep saying refined church is seven. And it's, it is uh, understood by all the scholars, by all the people who study numbers, that seven is the number of refinement. So wherever you see that, are y'all still warm? Let me get me some water here. Well, five is the number of grace throughout the scriptures. Yeah. I'm not going to go into that right now. But five is grace, and God gives grace to the 
total church. We'll get into that. David picked up five smooth stones. I don't believe it's because Goliath had four brothers. I believe it was because of the number of grace. Now, let's go back to Revelation, the first chapter, and we're going to get into all of these sevens. You're going to have... Uh, you're going to have sevens all through this book. Seventy times seven, that's the number of, of God's refined repentance. It's the number of God's completion of the church. Now, in order to understand, you've got seven throughout the book of Revelation. You're going to have... God is refining His people. And he's, when He's refining His people, He is uh, showing us... At the same time, he's refining us. He's showing us his covenant with his people. Well, I started to write something on the board. Uh, yeah, one thing we're going to run into, we're going to see seven spirits. We're going to see seven candlesticks. We're going to see seven seals. Well, we're going to see seven churches. Of course, that's the candlestick, seven churches. Seven churches. Seven spirits are the seven angels. And, of course, angel is the word A-G-G-E-L-O-S. And you've got to keep this in mind. Wherever you see, let me show you this. You're going to, that's right, you've got seven, seven stars. Hold on. Yeah, let's put that right under here. The seven stars are the seven spirits. Seven stars. And when you see the stars of heaven falling to earth, that's what you're going to see. They're one and the same. Okay. Then you're going to have seven seals, and seven trumpets. And when we see the last of the seven trumpets in Revelation... Revelation 10 and 7, Revelation 10 and 7, when the last trumpet sounds, the mystery of God is finished. And that word finished is T-E-L-E-I-O-T-E-S, and it means complete. When the last trumpet, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. Well, you got seven trumps in eight, nine, and ten. And when the seventh one sounds, the mystery of God is finished. Well, then you've got seven trumpets, and you've got seven, uh, seven seals and seven vials. And that word vial means bowls. you got seven bowls. Whatever, wherever you find the sevens, that's not just something for evil people to destroy them with. The sevens have to do with completing the church. That's what it has to do with. Completing or perfecting the church. In the New Testament, church is a Gentile church. Isn't it kind of interesting that seven is what completed Naaman? And he was a Gentile, wasn't he? He was a Gentile, and we see... All the same parallels all the way through the Scripture. Seven is the number of baptism, but baptism is not H2O or water. It's blood. A blood baptism was a death. Of course, baptize, B-A-P-T-I-Z-O is the Greek word. It means to cover. It comes from the word bapto, and that means to stain with a dye. And to stain, and we are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, and he's, he's washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, unless you look, when you're looking at Revelation, unless you see all this figurative language, and if you don't look at this as this metaphor, if you think these are literal scorpions coming up out of some hole in the ground, you're just lost as a goose right there. And if you think that uh, all of this is a bunch of uh, uh, nuclear warheads and bombs blowing up, uh, then you don't know what you're doing and you're really going to be lost. This is all figurative language is what it is. Let's go back to the first, uh, the first chapter of Revelation. Let me say this one more time. Here a few years ago, about four or five years ago, I said, I'm going to give you a thumbnail sketch of Revelation. 
I thought I was going to do that in one night. I preached on Revelation for years, and I got, in, I got into the first chapter, and I said, boy, this is a big thumbnail, isn't it? And I raced. I raced through the first chapter. I, I mean, I preached one message. I put uh, the title of it was Revelation 1, the glossary of Revelation. Well, well a glossary, a glossary, G-L-O-S-S-A. Gloss is the Greek word foreign language. It's foreign language. And we get the word glossary from that. And a glossary, the, here's a real good example of a glossary. I don't know if I got a book with some glossaries in it. I probably do one of these books or one of them at home. But a glossary is a section of a book. And it's, this word glossa is, means foreign language. And a glossary is a book, is a section of a book, usually in the back of the book, that's got real difficult words. It was a book written by someone who was very educated in some area. And a glossary is a section of a book where you go to look up words because you don't understand a lot of the words in it. Well, that's what a glossary is. Revelation, the first chapter, is a glossary for this book. All you have to do is go back to the first chapter and you can find uh, the reasons. You're going to find the sevens beginning here in Revelation, the first chapter. In fact, let's start here in the first chapter. And of course, the word revelation is the word A-P-O K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S Apocalypsis and apocalypsis comes from apo, meaning off, with the K-A-L-U-P-T-O. Calupto is the word cover, cover. And apocalypsis comes from the word apocalypto, or the word revealed. Revelation, people say, that's a secret book. Not according to the title, it's not. <laughs> it's not a secret book. You can't understand it if you don't read the Old Testament first. If you don't understand anything on the Old Testament, if you don't understand that you got seven candlesticks in the Old Testament, that's Jewish, and if you don't understand that the seven candlesticks were said to be the light of Israel in the, in the holy place, out in the, right in front of the veil, and if you don't understand that the rabbis said that the candlesticks that the candlesticks preached the gospel. They said it preached the truth. And then if you don't understand that David had a shield, David had a shield. I've studied this. I didn't study a little bit. Back when Mary was a legal secretary for an attorney back in 74, I had her write me a letter, had her type me out a letter to Hebrew universities. I went out on... I went out on uh, uh, West End to that synagogue out there and I asked them for a list of Hebrew universities in America. They gave me a list of Hebrew universities and I sent a letter to all those universities telling them I wanted to know about the Star of David because I had been studying it. Well, I got all kinds of information back and I lost those things. I was throwing some trash out one day and I threw all those letters out. And I had all this information on the David star. So a lot of times when you hear me saying stuff about that, it's stuff that I don't have any longer. I do have an a encyclopedia Judaica, a 17-volume set of Jewish encyclopedias, Isidore Singer. I've got the Hastings. I've got McClinic and Strong and, and Schaff Herzog and some others. And, uh, but they tell us that David wore, the, David wore the menorah on his shield. The, I don't know what his shield looked like, but the menorah is the seven candlesticks. That's what it is. And that the, uh, this, and this, this six-pointed star is called the shield of David. Now, most of the writers will tell you that this goes back uh, into about 200 B.C., and they say they can't trace it any further. But I believe we can trace it through Scripture and through history by applying things the way they should be applied. Instead of this way right here, the menorah right here, I believe this is what they saw. 
And I'll show you one more time. The menorah wasn't seven candlesticks side by side. What it was, it was like, so if I could have one made where you can look at it from the top, where all the arms of, a, of equal uh, length, and you could turn it side like that. It's actually on the Ark of Titus. This is what it'd be like. And when the Bible says, these seven are the eyes of the Lord, then what you would see, if you could get these all equal, you'd have this coming out to here, this coming out here, and you'd have the candlestick in the middle, and you'd have a seven-pointed, you'd have a six-pointed star, and the seventh one in the middle, that's what you'd have right here. When you look on the Ark of Titus, on the Ark of Titus, which was carried away into captivity, let me see here. Here's the Ark of Titus. You can see right here. Look here. Can you see that? Here's the candlesticks. It's three-dimensional. And when you look at it from the top, the floral pattern from the top, is a star of David. That's what it is. That shield of David, and they said David carried that on, their shield, on his shield. So when David went out to battle, he had on his shield the seven candlesticks. I believe this is what he had on his shield. That's what people were facing. And when they had a righteous king and he had that on his shield, it don't matter if it was 10 against 5 million, you're going to die. And that's the eyes of God that's going to come and bring judgment on you. It, it mattered not how many were in the, uh, uh, the other armies. God always, it's just like uh, Asa said, it's nothing with you, Lord, to help with few of those that have no power. Let not man prevail against thee. And he went into battle against a million Ethiopians that had 300 chariots of iron, and they conquered them with a half a million people with no chariots. Now let's look here in Revelation, the first chapter, first verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. What is that talking about? All through this book, John is going to say, The angel of the Lord came unto me and said, Come up hither, let me show you some things. Isn't that what he's saying? He's got the angel of God. It is probably Gabriel. Gabriel is the announcing angel of God. He went to Daniel and talked to him at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he also went to Mary and announced to her that she was going to have a child born of a virgin. Now, he said he sent and signified it. This, the word signified is the word simiao. It comes from the word simeon, S-E-M-E-I-O-N. Simeon, that word means a flag a sign, a beacon, what God is saying, I'm showing you by figures, I'm showing you by figures what's going to happen. I've said this before. This word Simeon would be best used in a situation. Here's a Simeon right here. Here's a sign right here. This would be a sign. Right here. Ding, 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 ding. Now, what does that mean? That's a sign that a train is coming. Huh? So what I'm trying to say to you, a Simeon, what he's going to do is use signs and allegories and pictures through this book to show us what these things mean. And he says it in the first verse. Why don't we believe that? This is when John was on Patmos, huh? That's right. That's right. John's on Patmos. And he said, the angel of the Lord's coming to me, and he's going to give me signs and signals and beacons and flags and show me by illustration and allegory what is to be. Well, if you don't study the allegories, you're going nowhere. The very first verse of the book of Revelation says, everything else in this book is going to be by signs and pictures and allegories. So you, I think you need to go back in the Old Testament and study it. Now let's go on. Who by record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ in all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep these things which are written therein for the time is at hand. 
John to the seven churches which are in Asia. I keep saying Asia, we think of Asia, uh, we think of Asia as over here and over here in India and China and Vietnam. They used to call French Indochina and, and uh, in all of this area over here. That's what we think of Asia. But Asia to them was western Turkey. Now, there were more than seven churches there, and John was in a little island right here just off the southwest coast of Turkey. That was called Asia Minor. And there's a little island out there called Patmos, and he wrote to seven of these churches here, but there were a whole lot more than seven churches in Asia. So seven is the number of the refined church. That's what he's talking about. Now, let's get back here. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Would somebody get me some water? I drank all this I had. I'm just uh, out of it. Now he says, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Seven. There we are back to the word seven. These churches are going to have to seven themselves. They're going to have to take an oath to God, aren't they? Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits. There's the seven spirits. Seven spirits. I've written all over these up here. You got seven spirits which are before his throne. What's the throne of God? What's the throne of God? Huh? The ark. The mercy seat of the ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant was the... In the Old Testament, that's where God would come down and sit and rule Israel from. The mercy seat. A tabernacle was a mobile temple, and then once they stabilized it and Solomon built it, it was a, it was a uh, permanent temple in one spot, and, it, and Solomon had a great white throne. If you don't read in some of your old encyclopedias and find out that Solomon had a throne made of ivory, well, then you understand the, what the great white throne, and that, that's an allegorical picture. And when you went before Solomon's great white throne, you stood before the judgment of God. And most people, oh, the great white throne, the judgment. That's where the evil people go and the, well, yeah, but, well, I won't get into judging right now. Okay. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him, which is and which was and which is to come. Now, if you don't understand by reading that they said that Zeus was, was, he is, and he is to come, and they said that Zeus was head and tail, that he was the Alpha and Omega. Well, if you don't understand this, when John is writing to the churches of Asia, you got all those pagan gods over here and people that believe in it. So John is emphasizing to these people in these areas, particularly up there at Pergamos, in northern Asia Minor, Pergamos was where the seat of Satan was. That's where the seat of Satan finally located one of the churches of Asia there in Revelation 2.13 when Cyrus marched down the riverbed and drove the uh, Chaldean magicians out. They found their seat in Pergamos, one of the seven churches of Asia. That's why they were so corrupted up there. Now, uh, and from verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, if there's one baptism, there it is right there. And when you get into the seventh chapter of Revelation, and we see that our robes are made white in the blood of Christ, a blood baptism makes righteousness, that's that's the true baptism. That's death to self, daily cross. And he hath made us kings and priests. When you get over to the 11th chapter of Revelation and you see the two witnesses, it's not Moses and Elijah. He plainly states that these are the two olive trees and it's quoted from Zechariah, the fourth chapter. And the last verse, it says these Two olive trees are the two witnesses. They are the two anointed ones that represent God in the earth that stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Well, the two that represent God in the earth in the Old Testament were the two anointed ones. They were the priest and king. Priest and king. So, see, he's setting up for us. 
He's setting up for us here how to interpret the book of Revelation as we go through it. The priest and the king are the two witnesses. And he's made us priests and kings. We've been anointed with the truth. What are we doing as priests? What do priests do? They offer acceptable sacrifice, uh, Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What do kings do? They declare righteous judgment, and when they didn't, they'd be removed from the throne in the Old Testament. We go around declaring the righteous judgment of God, and we, in so doing, people were to kill us, and we give our bodies a living sacrifice as the priest we're only a priest. The outer man is the priest. That self, he has to die. And the inner man is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the two get together and they vote and Christ gets his way and we got to die and witness. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. When he comes back, the Bible says that he will come back splitting the skies, as he said there in Matthew 24 and 28, or 27, he said, I'll, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, and every eye shall see him. That's what it says in verse 7. And they also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. Then you see in red letters, this is Christ speaking to John on Patmos. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. He's writing to these churches where they worship Zeus and they worship all these gods of the Olympiad out of Greece. And they, since they worship these gods, he's using terminology that they can understand. This was not strange terminology because Zeus, the father of the gods in Greece, same as Jupiter over in Rome, said he was the Alpha and Omega. He said he was head and tail. Of course, Zeus didn't say anything. He was dead God. It was the people said that he said that. They said, Zeus said that he said he was head and tail. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Notice that. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega. I am the Almighty God. Jesus is saying right here, I am Almighty God. When people say Jesus isn't God, this is a good place to take them to, isn't it? I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Of course, he was boiled in oil and exile on Patmos. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What is the Lord's day? Well, it is now, but what is he talking about here? He's talking about the first day of the week. That's the day where that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, and they set that up not as a substitution for the Sabbath. That was a special day that the apostles got together, and the believers in the early church, not the Sabbath. It was a day they got together to have a agape love feast and he said on this first day of the week I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet so he's equating voices with trumpets here isn't he isn't that right yeah. mm -hmm. what he's saying there's a voice that's a trumpet he's telling you when you see trumpets think of voices that's what he's saying this is a glossary voice remember the word voice phone P-H-O-N-E. looks like phone. Well, it is phone. The word is phone-A. In the Greek, it's voice. They, the voice is ringing. You pick, it, pick up the voice. Okay. And the, the voice or the trumpet was saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, if you got seven churches in Asia and you got seven candlesticks here, it is only natural that they are going to equate with one another. Here's the seven churches of Asia. He names them. And you have the seven churches of Asia. Seven is, there's more than seven churches in Asia. Colossia was in Asia. Troas was in Asia. There were many other churches in Asia, but seven is the number of refinement. 
And God has a reason for picking these churches out. Ephesus, Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, unto Laodicea. These are the seven churches found in Revelation, the second chapter, and Revelation, the third chapter. In each one of those churches, you see something wrong with them that they need to be sevened and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. The word is not candlestick. The word is menorah because the candlesticks, the only reason it says candlestick is because this was in the 1600s when the King James Bible was translated and wax candlesticks had begun to be used to light up the streets. They'd put them on in those little street lamps. They'd lift up the lamp. They'd lift it up and light the candlestick and pull it back down. You could have a way to see at night as you're walking down the street. And they put them in their houses. The word is menorah. The menorah was just like this right here, except it's hollow. You can see this is hollow inside. It was hollow. It was just like this, but it was, these arms were hollow and they fed oil into the candlesticks and the candlesticks were beaten gold is what they were made of. And they pounded it and beat the gold and that's a picture of us also going through the fiery trials and the outer part of the candlestick, here's the whole point. The outer part of the candlestick was the beaten gold. You had a pipe on the inside. Inside you had a space right here, and that was where the oil was. The oil was always a picture of the Holy Spirit. That's a picture of truth. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the truth, so the oil is the type of the truth, and the oil or the, or the, oil or the truth is in us. And the truth is in a refined church, isn't it? That's why you're going to find that the candlesticks is the type of the church, or that's you and I. The oil is the truth inside of us. We're the picture of the seven candlesticks. Seven candlesticks are the, of beaten gold. That's the church. That's the refined church. Seven is the number of refinement. That's, the, that's refined that's the refined church. That's what it is. I want you to just understand that, that when you look at those, think of the oil inside and the beaten gold which surrounds the oil. That's us, our bodies. Now, Jim, back in verse 10, I was in the Spirit. Would we be unnecessarily twisting that, knowing that the Spirit is the truth, to, to read I was in the truth? Well, he was in the truth on the Lord's day. Certainly, if there's anybody that knew the truth, I believe it was John the Beloved, wouldn't you say that? He wrote the book of John, uh, probably considered, he wrote the Gospel of John, considered to be, if there's a book that's considered to stand out among the Gospels and all the books of the Bible, if you'll notice, uh, it's considered to have to be a book that you can read and it will tell you the truth within itself. Uh, people go around, a lot of the publishing companies make just the Gospel of John to pass out. I've seen them all my life. They always have the Gospel of John. That's because John is one of the most in-depth Gospels in what it is saying. It's not one of the synoptic Gospels. The synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have a synonymous view, but John is a book that stands alone, stands above uh, most of the books of Scripture. And here's the man that wrote it. And if there's any man that was in the truth or in the Spirit on the Lord's day, it would certainly be John. Then he says in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Now remember, the voice is like a trumpet from verse 10, right? Uh, I turned to see the trumpet, or the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, or Christ, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, 
as white as snow, his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now we see Jesus coming back in Revelation, the 19th chapter. He's coming back with eyes as a flame of fire. We are, gosh, if I go into that, you remember the iris of the eye? The Bible, uh, Zechariah, the second chapter, anyone that touches Israel touches the apple of my eye. And the word apple is the word ba-ba, B-A-B-A-H. That is the word pupil. Well, you punch a man in the eye, if you punch him in the pupil of the eye, you've got the iris of the eye, which is a wheel and a wheel. And when you punch a man in the eye, the pupil contracts. You've got a wheel inside of a wheel. The inside of the iris of the eye is a little curtain-like thing. I've got that over here in, in the... Uh, uh, Gray's Anatomy over here. That's a contracting wheel. You punch a man in the eye. If you look at it from the side, if this is the eye, you punch him in the pupil of the eye. This section of the pupil will close up to protect what's in the eye, and the and the iris will bend back like so. The iris of the eye. And the word iris, iris was the old goddess of the rainbow. And the word iris in the Greek is the word rainbow. That's what the word rainbow in the Greek is the word iris in the 10th chapter of Revelation in the first verse. When you see the angel coming back with the rainbow on his head, you see, the, you see Christ coming back with an iris on his head. And that was a war bow in the book of Genesis when God put his bow in the cloud. When they were at peace... In the ancient world, they hung their bow this way up on the wall with the bow bending upward. When, when the uh, men were at war, they hung it like so with the bow part bending down. And when they were, uh, when they were, one man was submitting his army to another, he broke his bow and handed it to him. So how a bow was hanging, depending on whether they were at war or whether they were at peace, or if he broke it and handed it to him, he was submitting to the other man. All of this is significant. Now, where was I? 14. His head, his head and his hairs were like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. This is punching God in the eye. That's the eyes of the eye. And, and just to show you all of the various uh, nuances of this, what is it that goes into the pupil of the eye? What goes in the pupil? Huh? Light. <laughs> yeah, light. Well, who's the light of the world? That's us in the fifth chapter of Matthew. We're the light of the world. And when this happens, just to show, just to add, put this in with the sevens, when light goes through a prism, it breaks off into seven colors. That's what it does. Well... When the light goes into our eye, it goes, it, it's, it goes, it, when it goes through a prism, the first prism it goes through is the lens of your eye. The lens of your eye is layers of triangular shaped prisms, and they are one five thousandths of an inch thick. And then it goes to the fovea, the yellow spot in the back of your eye, right in the center of your eye, and it begins a refining process, and this is amazing because this is what God sees in us. You remember when the Bible would say uh, that he beheld the young, rich young ruler and behold how he loved him and he fixed his eyes upon him. What Christ is seeing in us is the image of himself. That's what he's seeing. What God is seeing in us is the image of his son. We're predestined to conform to the image of Christ. Now, You've got a lining in your eye. You've got a lining in your eye when you go into the, you go into the, here's, here's behind the, here's the cornea. Here's the, pu here's the, uh, the iris. And then you've got the, right behind here, you've got the lens. And the lens, that, the lens of the eye, that is the, uh, that's the, layers that are triangular shaped prisms that's prisms there and then you've got the the base of the eye down here you've got the optic nerve down here 
optic nerve, and then right straight, directly straight into the eye, back on the back of the eyeball, there's an inner layer here of the eye. This is the... Uh, It's the retina, isn't it? Isn't that it, Billy? That's the retina, I believe. The retina. And you've got a layer right inside that that is called Jacob's membrane. Now, why somebody would name it Jacob's membrane, they must have knew something about Scripture. They call it Jacob's membrane, and it is hundreds of thousands of... This is the best way I know to draw it. It's hundreds of thousands of hexagonal-shaped prisms. That's what it is. And this is what, these prisms is what de refines the colors. And when you're looking at someone, and God is looking at us, you do not see lines. You're not seeing lines when you're looking. You're not seeing lines, uh, the shape of me in lines and the, shades on me in lines. What you're seeing is the refraction of colors. You're seeing the refinement of colors. Well, that, the thing that starts this refinement, when, it, when the light goes through this, this uh, lens, it, it uh, begins a refining process. It breaks off into seven colors, and this lining, now I don't know exactly how it does that, but it starts refining the colors and it breaks them off, and the better vision you have, the more refining of colors, and the better you see shapes and figures. That's why some people, I had a, I worked with a piano player, he'd look up the street, and he said, can you see those letters on that sign? I said, I can't see the sign. He could sit there and read it. He, looked, he was like an Indian. He could look down and say, I dropped a quarter in the dark, and he reached down and pick it up. He had that kind of sight. I never saw anybody before that had that. But that's what happens. You, the colors start refining. And right here at the back of the eye is something called the F-O-V-E-A, fovea, C-E-N-T-R-A-L-I-S, fovea centralis. That is the yellow spot, yellow spot. Well, yellow is always, all through Scripture, the color of fire. And I could go further into this, but I'm not going to do that. I got too, many, too far to go here. I got too much more. So that was just to bring out, uh, if you punch someone in the eye, then that bends back. And God said that we're the light, we're that, goes, that we're the pupil of his eye. The pupil, the whole, only purpose, the pupil is an opening. It's an opening for light to go in, and then it's refined. And when God sees us, here's the amazing thing. He's predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son, hasn't he? When you see images, you don't see, you do not see lines. You see refraction of colors. That's what you see. So when he's predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ, what if I said he's predestined us to be conformed to the colors of Christ? And you see right here, you see Christ represented in colors. In this first chapter, you see Christ represented in colors in the... 10th chapter of Revelation, and you see Christ represented in colors in the, I believe it's the 11th chapter of Daniel, or 10th chapter of Daniel. You see him represented in colors. So we are predestined to conform to the image of the likeness of Jesus, and all colors have a, have a representation in Scripture. Now, let's continue going here. We see here his head is like white, like wool. There's a color. I went through this when I went through the eyes of the Lord. His eyes is a flame of fire. Fire is the color of yellow throughout the Scripture. His feet like fine brass. There's a color. Some will say brass is copper, a reddish color. Uh, that, but we're talking about biblical word brass. <laughs> the biblical word brass a lot of time has the idea of copper with it. Sometimes they didn't have alloys back then. Uh, that's been a toss-up as to actually what that means. Sometimes it actually means copper. Then if they had, as if they had burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars. 
Now, when you see the stars of heaven falling to earth in the 8th chapter, in the ninth chapter of Revelation, this is what it's talking about. Head in his right hand. Now, remember, right hand is the hand of authority, always. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father as the prince who is to be made king. It does not mean... Uh, it does not mean a literal right hand. When it says Christ has in his right hand seven stars, he has at his authority. He's got seven stars which will declare his judgments. That's what he's talking about. This is figurative language. Miss this and you'll miss the, what he's talking about here. He had in his right... In fact, let me just show you something over in... Go over here to the fifth chapter of Revelation. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within. This is talking about the Word of God that's written in our hearts. That's a different kind of book. It's not written on tables of stone anymore, and it is in the right hand of Christ, isn't it? Yeah. It's in the right hand just as the seven, just as these uh, seven stars are in his right hand. Well, do you think in any possible way the seven stars might equate with the little book in his right hand? When you see these things, notice what it says. I believe that's exactly... Huh? They're angels, too. What? Stars are angels, too. Well, we're going to say that here in a minute. Let us get to it. <laughs> Let me do this. Let me erase this and start here, up here. So you've got... Let me kind of start it again. I've got some of it over here, but you got seven stars, seven stars, and all of this has to do with Naaman being dipped seven times because the seven has the same meaning wherever you find it. It's God's refinement is what it is. Now, he had in his right hand seven stars. Seven stars, but he's also, you remember... Uh, over here in, in chapter 4, verse 4, and from seven spirits which be, are before his throne. Seven spirits. The seven spirits are going to be the seven stars. No, it's one refined doctrine, Mary. One refined doctrine. Seven is the number of... Don't think of this as literal seven numbers. Seven people over there. Seven. Seven is the number of refinement. This is figurative language. It's the way they thought. What? No, I meant one and four. Oh, one and four. One and four of Revelation and, bef and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. The seven spirits you're going to find are the seven stars. I'm going to go slow here. I'm going to try to right here. The seven spirits are seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. We know, we know that's figurative. If that's figurative, so is everything else because what's going out of the mouth of Christ is the Word of God, isn't it? The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword there in the fourth chapter of Hebrews. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. I think with this kind of a vision, this would make you collapse in complete weakness, wouldn't it? And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. You notice he lays his right hand upon him, He's got a little book in his right hand in the fourth chapter, in the first verse, and he's got seven stars in his right hand. Yeah. yeah. Now, I am the first and the last. That's what Zeus said of himself. That's what they said when they invented him. They said, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He's talking about his resurrection right here, isn't he? 
I'm he that liveth, and I was dead, and I'm alive now, I've resurrected, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Satan doesn't have the keys to death. Satan is killing no one. Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, I kill, I make alive. I wound, I heal. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. He's talking about his reference is back here to verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars. And here's the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, my hand of authority. The reason the stars are there, whatever is in the right hand of God or the right hand of Christ, that's, good. that's the execution of judgment upon evil men, evil people. Right hand is always. Didn't the Lord say, I'll make you to sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? said that repeatedly. And he says, here's the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven candlesticks. This is why I say that the book of Revelations is about the church, the New Testament church. It's not just about future events. How long have we had the candlesticks? We've had them since the book of Exodus, but the original candlesticks was the Pleiades, the seven stars in the left shoulder of Taurus, and the rabbis said that the Pleiades, the morning star, gosh, and when you get into that, we're going to get into the morning star in the third chapter, uh, the second chapter of Revelation, and we're going to get into the morning star in the 22nd chapter of Revelation. That's what Zachariah went through this month was talking about the seven candlesticks. That's right. That's right. You can't, you can't ever leave it. You can't leave the significance and the picture of it wherever you go. It don't matter where you go, you can't leave it. It's going to have the same application wherever you go. Now, he's, the Pleiades, let me just say this. You've got the Pleiades. Pleiades. And of course, in Job, the 38th chapter, God said to Job, 38th chapter, he said, Can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? Sweet influences. And he said, or loose the bands of Orion. Loose bands of Orion. Pleiades was the seven stars in the le seven stars. Notice that. The seven stars brings judgment in the Old Testament, the old rabbi said the seven stars was the Pleiades and that it had sweet influences. They said, Rabbi, rabbi Aben Ezra said that the Pleiades had great warmth. Great warmth. And that's what brought out the crops in the spring. And that's, I believe, Rabbi Aben Ezra is picturing what God said when he said, when God said, bind the sweet influences. Well, great warmth meant that the sap would come up in the spring and that they would have crops in the spring. That's the sweet influences. The sweet influences of Pleiades doesn't mean the stars are going to influence your life and have, a, and have an effect on you whether you're in the third house of this uh, uh, zodiac or you're in this decon or whatever. No, the sweet influences is the apple blossoms blooming. That's a sign of prosperity. That's a sign that crops would be in the spring or the new mown hay. The mown hay. The smell of the spring. That's the sweet influences. And the bands of Orion... What God is telling Job, can you stop the sweet influences and stop the sap from coming out, and can you bring famine? That's what he was saying. If you say you're innocent and you're doing all these great things, can you do that? The rabbi said that Orion 
had great cold, and of course, Pleiades was called morning star. Morning star. In 2 Peter, Peter calls the morning star the day star. Day star, and that's what it's called because the morning star comes out in the spring, in the spring, and the pagans call the morning star Venus. The Bible calls the morning star Jesus. So whenever we have the morning star, we have the Pleiades are the seven stars. What is it that we have when we have this? We have the truth in us because what is the stars? Look here. Look at it. Look here. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, the messengers of the refined church. The reason seven churches is because this is the refined church. When the church is refined, they're going to be telling the truth, aren't they? When you're mature, you're going to tell the truth. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So when, you're, when we have the seven stars, notice that seven stars equals messengers of the refined church. And if we're refined and mature, we're telling truth telling truth, and we have the seven stars, don't we? The seven stars is the truth that's in us. It's the message. If you have the candlesticks, what good are the candlesticks without the oil in it? Huh? Can you understand that? Having the seven stars is a picture of having the oil. Can you see that? Is that hard to see? Somebody shake your head yes or no. Huh? Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? In the Old Testament, when they said that you have the seven stars, they said you had the Pleiades. You had the morning star. That's what they said. Look at Amos. Go back to Amos, the fifth chapter. Now, how do you, if you equate the, the seven spirits with the seven stars? The, seven, the spirit is the truth, right? Because the Bible says that's what they are. The Bible says in... But, Gerald, seven is the number of refinement. It's one church. It's not really talking about seven different churches. It's talking about one church refined. Seven is the word that you've got to get out of understanding. We're not talking about seven truths. You, you mean when you got these candlesticks and you got oil in this and you got oil in this over here, and they go back to the same reservoir, that that's different than this oil over here? Huh? It's one oil. One oil. Seven is just, it's a, if you miss the figurative picture, you're going to miss this altogether. Don't think this is seven truths. Seven is refinement. You've got to remember that. Look over here in Amos, the fifth chapter. I hope this doesn't get... This is the way you think when you're working algebra. It's figurative. It's conceptual thinking. You've got to think concept. Get out of the idea that this is seven different churches. It's the refined church. That's what he's talking about. Seven, seven, seven candlesticks with one reservoir. Well, sure it is. Yeah. But it's actually not seven, Gerald. Isn't that one unit? That's one, yeah, right. If, you, if I got this right here, is that seven different items of furniture? No. It's one, isn't it? One, yeah. And they all come out from the center candlestick, don't they? Right. You know what it makes me think of? I am the vine, you are the branches. Okay. Makes me think of Christ being the center candlestick mm -hmm. or in the midst of us. Look here. Look over here in... Look at Amos. Go to Amos. I'm really, this is too much to get through in a lesson. 
I said I was going to teach on sevens. You can't teach on sevens one day. Look at the fifth chapter of Amos. When, when Israel came into... Amos is preaching against Israel for the way they've lived. Amos, the fifth chapter... And he's preaching against them. When they, came in, when they came in, you remember when they came in here just above the Dead Sea and they encamped at a place called Gilgal? They brought their idol gods with them to Gilgal. And look here what he says here in verse, uh, verse 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me and ye shall live. But seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal. That's where they put up their idol gods in northern Israel. And pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. Seek the Lord, and ye shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph. What's the house of Joseph? Northern Israel. That's right. And devour it, that there be none to quench it in Israel, in, in Bethel, Ye who turn judgment to wormwood, wormwood was what the Jews called the trials of life. That's a bitter herb. And leave off righteousness in the earth. Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. What he's saying, seek him that can bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion. What is loosing the bands of Orion? Orion was the evening star. The evening star came out in the winter, and the old rabbis said, it's not a point of whether the Pleiades caused the sap to come up in the vine. It's not a point as to whether Orion caused the sap to go down. God says, that's what your custom and culture says. Let me tell you, I can bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and keep the crops from coming out and bring famine. You better seek me. I'm the one that can stop Orion. They said Orion brought the sap down, and if the sap doesn't come down in the winter, what happens to the trees? They die in a freeze, in a frost. God said, I can loose the bands of Orion. I can cause, right in the middle of winter, I can cause a warm front to come in and bring the temperature up to 80 degrees for about three weeks. That's loosening the band of Orion. And then I'll hit you with zero and I'll kill all your trees and your crops. That's what he's talking about. God took their culture and customs and threw it right back in their face. Now, yeah, let me finish reading this. We've seen that happen, really. We've seen it happen one year. We had a, about a three-week warm front come in, and the trees started, the leaves started coming out. It was the middle of January, and it dropped to 10 degrees the week after that, and it killed all the shrubs all over Hendersonville. Don't, can you remember that? Killed everything dead as a doornail. And everybody had to go out and have all their, anybody who had any, any landscaping had to have it all redone that 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 spring, because it killed everything in town. Yeah. Everything was blooming. Yeah. That's loosing the bands of Orion. God said, I'll show you how I'll bring judgment on you. I'll loose the bands of Orion. I'll bring the sap up in the middle of the winter, and I'll destroy you with freeze. That's what he's talking about. So when you're talking, you're still talking about the same picture of seven stars over here in Amos. Do you think the seven stars in Amos is any different than over here? The seven stars is a picture of truth. When you're in truth, what did God say in Deuteronomy 28? He said, your crops, you'll have plenty of crops. I'll loose the bands of Pleiades. I'll bind Orion instead of the opposite. Yeah. He said, that's what I'll do. But if you don't, I'll loose. He said, I'll bind Pleiades and I'll loose Orion. He used their culture to tell them what to do. So you got seven stars over here. And he says that. He says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion and turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day dark with night that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. God said, I'll bring you rain if you seek the seven stars in Orion. If not, the heavens will be brass and the earth will be iron. That's the judgment of God, isn't it? So the seven stars is a picture of truth, isn't it? Yeah. 
Truth brings food. Instead, they went after the fertility gods, Baal in the grove. You notice this goes right back to Christmas. That strengtheneth the spoil against the strong, so that the spoil shall come against the fortress. Now, and let's just go ahead and read that. I'm out of time, ain't I? Am I out? Gosh, I feel like I'm getting started. Go to, let me read to you Job before we quit. Job 38. I don't know how I can preach seven without taking four or five months, but I will come back to 2 Kings. Go to Job real quick. Just go to Job real quick. And I'll stop. I get into Revelation. I really like this. I love the book of Revelation. I love to teach it. Hadn't been in it so long. I just get hungry to teach when I get there. Uh, this, this kind of... Whew, I could talk about this. All. Look uh, down here in verse 31 of chapter 38 of Job. Job had said he was innocent. And God's wanting to tell him, Hey, can you do all these things? Can you... Out of whose womb does the ice come? In verse 29. Or the hoary frost of heaven. Who, who genders it? Or the waters that are hid with the stone... And the face of the deep is frozen. Who does that? I do that, he says. And, of course, this is the chapter where he says, Can you send forth lightnings? And they'll come to you and say, Here we are. Where shall we strike? Lightning bolts reporting for duty, sir. Then he says here in verse 31, Can thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Can thou bring forth Maseroth? That's the zodiac. In his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? And that's one of the sets of stars of the heavens. Can you do these things? So when we see the seven stars in the Old Testament, I'll finish this up next week. I could go into the morning star of Revelation, but remember that the seven stars is the Pleiades originally, and that's the morning star in the spring that brings out the crops. So when we get to the morning star in Revelation, if you understand this from the Old Testament, then you're going to see what this is about. The seven spirits are the seven angels. It's not seven angels. It's just one spirit. It's one oil running through that stick, those candles, isn't it? One oil. The seven spirits are actually the one oil, and seven being the number of refinement. Can we see that? It's one oil running... Don't think in numbers. numbers right. When you start trying to think numbers mean exact numbers, then you're really going to be lost. Yeah, it ain't, it ain't true, yeah. Numbers are figurative in the Bible. All through it. And then it ain't so. That's right. Let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stay in these sevens through Revelation. I may not go into a whole bunch of things in here, but I'm going to do this on Sunday night till we get... Uh, under, and I'll go back and review this and help you to see it. Seven is, the num is a number that means refinement, completion. That's what it means. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. Help us to understand your word more thoroughly each day. Deal with our hearts and our lives. and God, supply the need and the way for this ministry. Supply us spiritually and financially, that we'll be able to grow and reach the elect out there in the world. That's my only hope and dream, Lord, while I live here. If I can't do that, I'd just soon come to be with you right now. Let us reach your elect as far out as we can reach, Lord. If it's be according to your will and your mercy, open the doors for us. And God will give you praise and glory for everything. You'll have to give us strength to do that. Manipulate our minds and our lives and our thoughts to do all that we can do for you. And we entrust this in your hands. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> we just got started. That's why I can't do a thumbnail sketch of that. It's too much. Ain't no thumbnails, is it? It just keeps going, don't it? Huh? Well, the pup God said Israel is the apple of my eye. The word apple is pupil. Okay. What's the word apple in Genesis? Ba-ba, B-A-B-A-H. Okay. What's the apple in Genesis? 
Well, that's not the same thing. That's not an apple. That's fruit of the tree. Doesn't, doesn't say an apple. See right here? Wait a minute. Here. After the glory hath he sent me to the nations which spoil you, for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. To spoil means to carry away into captivity. He's talking to Babylon and Persia who has carried Israel. If you touch Israel, you've touched the pupil of his eye. You punch him in the eye, and eyes, his eye, that's why he's coming back with eyes as a flame of fire. The world has touched the wife of the Lord. If you want to make God angry at you, mess with his wife. That's the way you get in trouble with God. Hey, uh, Joyce, don't run off. Let me show you this, Jim. <coughs> this was in the paper. <coughs> this, this was in the Tennessee, and on the 18th of September, they had 61 new citizens took the oath of, of citizenship down at the Hermitage, and this man Imad Yosef who is a an Egyptian said it's like my birthday he was born again oh. he was born he again used, in other words he was using 2,000 year old terminology he said this is my birthday yeah I'm born into the state of na into the new into the nation of America yeah it's my birthday he knew what it that meant didn't he fantastic. yeah that's funny Oh, that's you great. Doing? I just, a uh, fellowship for three or four days. We, we'd Hello. like to do that. We're just going to see if we can, we're going to see if we can get some people together. What are you doing, Michael? What's going on? Find some more words. You need some tapes. We've got some extras over there. I'm doing good with the words. Are you? Well, we got plenty. See where it says extra? If you want them where it says extra, you can pick those up. And these, we got some of the videos if you want those. I, I got one video. You got to take it with you. Well, you can. That's the one I did last Sunday morning. That is a really good tape. And that, that's that Wednesday night tape. This past Wednesday. Were you here Wednesday? That's why I was talking about the shadows. Hey! <laughs> Larry, Larry made me feel good just now. He said he, I was, he was glad I asked that question because he was confused. What, what, oh, on the seven? Yeah. Yeah. You got to get out of thinking of these numbers as numbers exactly. They're numbers in the respect of what the when the Jews said seven, they didn't mean exactly one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right. Certainly, it meant that to them, but it had a greater meaning than that. Yeah. It had a cultural meaning. It was a refined. It was a refinement. Yeah.